rich, soft, squidgy, and delicious. No, not my wife. Today we're talking brioche or brioche or brioche, depending where in the world you are. So yes, brioche, an absolute French classic, a really luxurious treat. I want to show you how to make it, shape it and bake it and hopefully transform your breakfasts forever. So for this recipe, you're gonna need 500 grams of strong white bread flour, 450 grams of eggs. Now, I know it's a little unromantic and a bit clinical and scientific to be weighing your eggs, but these are both medium eggs in my eyes. This one weighs 70 grams, this one weighs 60 grams. So if I just said eight eggs, you could end up being 80, maybe even 100 grams out, and what is already a pretty wet, sticky dough is just going to end up being a dough soup. So weigh your eggs. If it's a little bit over, just take out what's, take it down to 450, but reserve what's left over because we can use that to glaze it later. If you're a little bit under, you're probably fine. Uh, and if you're bang on, like I was, you'll need one extra egg later to glaze the loaves. Then we've got 300 grams of butter. Yes, you know I'm a sucker for butter, so I'm only putting 300 grams in. If you only had a 250 gram pack, that would probably be absolutely fine, but why not go for it? Then I'm using 50 grams of caster sugar. Again, if you like your brioche a little sweeter, you can push that up to 60, 70, 80 grams. But let's be honest, this is gonna be slathered with some jam at breakfast. So I'm quite happy to keep the sugar levels quite low. Also, you can serve brioche with savory things like pâtés or foie gras is a real classic. So if you're going down the savory route, then maybe keeping the sweetness down might be a good idea. Um, eight grams of salt and then 12 grams of instant yeast. Now for this recipe, you are gonna need a mixer or a KitchenAid. It, like I said, it's a wet, sticky dough, and there's a fair bit of mixing involved because you'll notice in this recipe, I'm not using any water or even milk. All the hydration is just coming from the eggs and the butter. So we're gonna do like a two-stage mixing process. First of all, everything except the butter. Basically, butter or fat uh, inhibits gluten development. So we wanna be using the water that's naturally in eggs. They're about 75% water. So we'll get them mixed with the flour to start with, get our gluten developed, the dough mixed, and then it's just a case of incorporating the butter. So we're gonna need our 500 grams of flour in there, the 450 grams of eggs, the sugar, the salt, make sure we get it all in, and finally our yeast, sprinkle that over the top, and then we're gonna mix this on a medium speed, so we'll start off low, move it up to a medium, and then mix it for a good five minutes. Like I say, we want it to be well incorporated and the gluten to be developed. So you look at, it's not going to come together in a ball because it is quite wet, but you should see it kind of reach the stage where it's pulling away from the sides of the bowl. So look out for that, but five minutes should do it. Okay, that is looking nice smooth, everything's incorporated. I can see we've got some good gluten development where it's pulling away there. So now we can add the butter. Now you need your butter really soft, room temperature, really nice and, mm, really nice and squidgy. That can just go in like that. You could cut it up in small pieces, but honestly, if it's soft enough, it will all get incorporated. So, in we go with the butter. Just gonna use the spatula to get 
and that down and that bit off there. So we'll switch that on, we'll give it a mix for another five minutes. If any of the butter gets stuck on the side, just use your spatula to push it back in. Scrape those sides down. Scrape it off onto the dough hook. There we go, that has come together nicely, looking really smooth, silky, shiny, almost like a really thick mayonnaise, but it's not, it's brioche dough. So we're gonna scrape that off the dough hook, like so. Just clean down the sides of the bowl. Look at that, absolutely beautiful. Cover that with some cling film, like so. And now you want to let that proof at room temperature for maybe one to two hours, and then you want to get it in the fridge and let it proof overnight. The reason you want to put it in the fridge is A, it's going to slow down the fermentation and we're going to develop a lot more flavour, but B, if you try and tip that out and shape that, good luck to you. You need to get it in the fridge for the butter to harden, the dough will firm up and then it's just going to become a whole lot manageable. So like I say, one or two hours at room temperature to get fermentation going, you should see some growth and then into the fridge overnight. Okay then, so our dough has proved overnight. That's been just under 12 hours, but if you were out for the day at work or something, then you could certainly leave it till the afternoon, evening. Once it's chilled in the fridge, it's gonna hold pretty well. As you can see, we've got some good growth, some good volume. I left it out for about three hours in the end before I went to bed, and it was doming. So I just had to go around with a dough scraper knocking out a little bit of the air just so I could cover it and get it in the fridge and not worry about it overflowing overnight. But you can see it's firmed up nicely. This will now be workable. So you really do need to chill it. If you don't want to do it overnight, then maybe an hour or two in the fridge would do it. But the overnight proof doesn't just firm it up. It also helps with the flavor. So you're going to need two loaf tins for this. I'm going to be using my two pound loaf tins that I bake my standard bread dough in. Probably a little bit big for this recipe. Uh, normally I'd just be baking one loaf and I'd do it in this tin, which is a touch smaller and it'll ensure I get a good proud loaf. But I wanted to bake two loaves for this video, primarily so I can show you the shaping, once from the front and then once I'm going to try and film it from above because we're going to do a nice plat, which is kind of traditionally how you see it uh, presented in France. Uh, so there's a little bit of instruction to follow and I think the overhead shot might help. So let's get cracking a little bit of rice flour or just bread flour if you haven't got the rice flour. But do try and get hold of that, it's really good for non-sticking. And then the dough out. Here it comes. Look at the texture and the structure in there, brilliant. So that's going to be nice and light. Get all of it, we don't want to waste any of this. This is good stuff. Okay, now we've got to work fairly quickly because we don't want this to come up to room temperature whilst we're working it and it's going to get very sticky. So. We need to cut this in two, and then we need to cut each half in two again. So we want this in four equal pieces. So I'm just gonna, as always, get it into a kind of a cylinder that's manageable. One, two, I've got my scales here. Ah, oh, doorbell, hold the line.
Nice. Our son came second in an art competition, and that's his prize just turned up. So, as I was saying, we've divided this in two. We'll weigh these. So that one's 640. That one is 688. Pretty good. Happy with that. And now we'll divide each of these in two again. I'm going to just keep them dusted with a little bit of flour so they don't get too sticky. And there. Okay then. Get rid of that. So we need to, we'll do these one at a time. So you want to roll these into two long, fairly long sausages, about two, two and a half feet long. So just roll it over, get it into a smooth cylinder and then making sure you've got enough flour down so it doesn't stick. Just roll it out. Something like that. And now, because of the way we're gonna shape these, you actually want to taper the middle bit down as well. So just concentrate on the middle, give it a little bit of extra rolling. Stretch that middle out a bit. There we go. Like that, so you've kind of got a sausage that's thin, fat, thin, fat. Don't go mad, but you'll see later why that just helps. We'll do the same with this one. There we go, so now I've got my two sausages. This one could do with being a touch longer. Just gonna scrape those bits of dough off on the table. Now, the plaiting or the knotting. So you wanna put, you wanna make a cross. So you're gonna put that one that way and you're gonna lay this one on top that way, in a cross. Now the one that's underneath is the one we're gonna start with. So you wanna take the top corner and you're gonna bring it down to the bottom in line with the other one. And now you're gonna take the one from the bottom and bring it up to the top. So now you've created a loop over that one. Now you've got to do the same on the other side. Top, bring it down. Bottom, take it up. And now we're going to do the same again. Top, down, bottom, up. Top, down, bottom, up. And we'll do a couple more. Top, down, bottom, up. And we're kind of there. If you were doing a sort of free form loaf, you could carry this on and do a really long plait but we're kind of making a shorter knot that's going to fit in a loaf tin. So now, your two end bits, pinch them together on each side, and we can just tuck them underneath. And now you can see we've got a nice looking knot. Now, the reason we did that little bit of extra rolling in the middle is because this was the middle here, and if you don't do that, you're going to end up with a very fat knot at this end and thin at that end. So doing the extra bit of rolling, tapering in the middle, just ensures you get a sort of nice, even looking knot. It's not the end of the world if you don't do it, but once you've done this a few times, and you will because it's a bit of a showstopper, um, you're gonna want to perfect it. And it's those little things that just make it look super neat. Right, in the tin, as you can see, it's almost looking a little bit lost in there, but it'll double in size. It's gonna proof up nicely. Um, so we may not get the real volume on top, but you're still gonna get to see how it comes together and what the loaf looks like. Now I'm gonna film one from above so you can follow the knotting process. Okay then, so from above, we've got our two sausages. We wanna pull this one down like so, and we want to lay this one over the top of it to form a cross, and we've got our two slightly thinner bits overlapping in the middle. So now we're gonna take this side, lift it up, bring it down, and then take the one next to it and take it up. Then we're gonna take this side, bring it down, Ooh, don't pull too hard, and then this side, Put it up, then we're going to go down, 
quite tricky with one hand. Up, down, up, down, up. That's probably as far as we can go. As before, the two loose ends, or the four loose ends, squeeze them together, tuck them under, and once again, we've got a nice, neat knot. That goes into the tin. And now we want to proof these for a good two hours, maybe a bit longer. Remember, these are fridge cold at the moment, so not a lot of activity, activity going on there. It's gonna take an hour for them to come to room temperature, and then probably another hour to double in size. So just keep an eye on them, cover them with a tea towel, uh, and then we'll get them glazed and baked. Okay, so these are proof for two and a half hours. Looking pretty good, puffed up nicely. I actually transferred one of them to the smaller tin, uh, just so I could show you how it looks. It sort of sits quite snugly and it's domed above the tin. This one, you can see it still sat quite low in there and we've even got a gap down the corner. So a two pound loaf tin probably is a little big for one of these loaves, but we'll bake them up. They're gonna expand, so we'll see how they look. Before we bake them though, we just wanna get give them a bit of a glaze. So either use the egg that you reserved when you measured them out, or if you didn't have any left, just beat an egg in a bowl, and I add a teaspoon of cream. Uh, you don't have to do that, but I just think it helps give a color. I like the finish it gives. So I'm gonna brush them all over with the egg and cream wash. Just being careful that you don't push too hard and deflate it, but you should be okay. I mean, it's delicate dough, but it's not that delicate. There we go. So now if I had some pearl sugar, I'd probably sprinkle a bit of that on top. Looks nice, very classic, but I haven't got any. So we're gonna have to go plain. Now I've got my oven preheated, but unlike with the standard loaves, you don't want your oven full whack. We're not looking 240, 250. I like to cook my brioche much lower. Now you'll see a lot of recipes recommend around the 200 degree mark, but for me, I still find that's a bit high. It gets a little too dark, almost burnt on the outside. So I'm thinking more down that Victoria sponge route and I'm taking the temperature down to about 180. And I'm gonna bake these for 35, maybe even 40 minutes. I'd err on the side of caution and cook them slightly longer than you think. I've been caught out a couple of times where I've cut through and the middle's still a little bit doughy, almost battery, because remember, this is a very wet, loose dough. So just push it a bit and then you can gauge it for the next time and you'll sort of hone in on your ideal temperature and duration. But for me, I think a good starting point would be 180 degrees for 35 minutes. So I'm gonna get them in and then we shall see and taste those results. Okay, there we have it, the final loaves. Looking pretty good. We've got the light color where the knots are kind of pulling apart and then the really dark sort of chestnut from the glaze. I got them out of the oven and I got them onto a wire rack to cool. I'll just show you with the paper, it's really easy. You can just lift the whole thing up, get it on the rack and leave them to cool in the paper. That's absolutely fine. What we'll do is we'll cut into this one. This was the one in the, that I transferred to the smaller tin uh, and actually, probably didn't come out quite as well. The bigger tin, it's held its shape more nicely. This one, one of the knots kind of blew on the side. It's not really an issue, but it's a bit more of a problem to get it into the toaster. So we'll cut this one open. I'll just show you the bottom. So where it was knotted and then we've tucked those bits underneath, they all proof into each other and it comes out as one no, loaf. Look at that color, absolutely beautiful. So we'll get that out of the way. We'll cut into the end of this. Hopefully it's cooled enough not to be all doughy inside. Oh, look at that. Gorgeous, the color's lovely. It's got a real yellowness. Use some good eggs, use some good butter. That's what it's all about. 
Um, I'm going to take another little slice. I don't want to eat the crust. I want to treat myself to a really nice squidgy bit. Look at that, beautiful. I did cook mine for about 40 minutes in total. Like I say, probably better to push it a bit longer rather than ending up with any sort of soft doughy stuff. So we'll give that a look at the way it tears, almost like a panettone. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> Obviously, butter. But not just butter, really nice fermentation, yeasty flavours, almost a slight tang to it from that cold overnight proof. It's absolutely delicious. I could get through that, no problem. It makes such a good breakfast though. Slice it up, toast it, a little bit of extra butter, some strawberry jam, a pot of coffee. What more could you ask for? The recipe is enough for two loaves, but do bake two. You can never have too much brioche in the house. And if you've got any left over in the week, it makes fantastic pempadou or eggy bread, as you might know it, or the ultimate bread and butter pudding. So it's not going to go to waste. Bake up your two loaves, treat yourself and the family. If you've enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up. Please give it a go. Leave your comments below. If you make it, you can send me pictures via the website, busbybakes.com, or just post them on Instagram with the hashtag busbybakes. I look forward to seeing your results. So until next time, <laughs> baking. <laughs>